Um, the, the title for this, the theme for our, our um, for this Youth Sunday, a lot of us might have been wondering, ah, we just finished Crown of Glory and Honor. This Youth again, Crown of Glory. When I was praying for the theme, something dropped into my spirit and it said, Carriers of Glory. Carriers of Glory. And then I struggled with it because I felt that was too plain. I was like, Carriers of Glory, God. We've been talking of glory since the beginning of, you know, January, but, you know, it's never enough. But, you know, sometimes our minds, we try to, will I say, over-spiritualize the things of God. And we want to hear something really, you know, and God is just saying carriers of glory. The next morning, during the next evening, during prayer, uh, um, 10 a.m., 10 p.m. prayer, the Holy Spirit told me to open to the book of Isaiah chapter 62, verse 3. To be honest, I didn't know what was in that verse. I just heard it in my spirit, Isaiah 62, verse 3. And when I opened it, it said, Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Then I was confused. I was like, God, which one? Carriers of glory or crown of glory? And the Holy Spirit said to me, you're making it too difficult. They are the same thing. A crown of glory is a carrier of glory. And Sister Dolapa has talked to us a lot this morning about carrying God's glory, carrying His presence. So you see why I say it's almost the same thing. After the Holy Spirit said that to me, I didn't need any definition for a crown anymore. A crown of God's glory is a carrier of God's glory. They are the same thing. A crown, furthermore, is an embodiment or a carrier or a symbol of something. A crown is an embodiment, a carrier or a symbol of something. I want to say to us this morning that we've heard so much, you know, sometimes we, we've heard so much about, about God saying to us that His glory is on us. We will show forth His glory. But I want you to see yourself today as the crown of God's glory. You are not just carrying His glory. You are the crown of His glory. When I saw this in this verse, I was like, this is too much, God. I, I must be a pretty big deal for you to tell me that I'm the crown of your glory. And then I was confused. I said, but God, you don't share your glory with any man. So how would you make me, that is not even me, just me like this, the crown of your glory? And then the Holy Spirit started explaining some things that we would look at today. We know that God will not share his glory with any man, right? He will not share his glory with any man. Isaiah 42 verse 8. Isaiah 42 verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And then I was like, well, how am I carrying this glory? And the Holy Spirit started explaining, you know, God is inseparable from his glory, right? In First Chronicles 16.27, our sister read that this morning too. First Chronicles 16.27, glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. So it means we can't say God came here, oh, but Kai is like he forgot his glory in heaven. It means everywhere God is, his glory will be there. And what does he say in First John 4 4? This was exciting. I'm sorry if I get too excited, but he says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So we're saying God is inseparable from his glory. Wherever he is, his glory is there. And he's saying, I live inside of you. What does this equal? His glory is inside of you. You are carrying God's glory. You are a carrier of his glory. Amen. But the trick here, you may wonder, this is too big. Ah, God, please, you know, you resist the power. But the trick here that God said, said, the trick here is that God is looking for vessels that will show forth his glory and not take his glory. There's a difference between carrying something and being that thing. When you carry something, if I'm carrying this Bible, you can see me carrying it. I am showing it to you. But you can't say, Tomiwa is the Bible. Or you can't say, the Bible is Tomiwa. I don't become the Bible just because I'm carrying it. I don't, I don't take God's glory just because I'm a carrier of it. So it means God wants to put his glory inside of me so it can be shown to the world. Because God wouldn't come down in human form and say, because I want to show my glory, I'll come down in human form. So he has created us and poured, we are like vessels, and he pours his glory in so that the world can look and say, wow, that is God's glory. That is it, not for us to take the glory. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9, we've read this verse over and over. First Peter 2 verse 9, 
But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth, show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When I read this in, I think, ESV version, it said, show forth the virtues of him who has called you into marvelous light. So it means that your primary purpose here on earth is to show forth God's virtues. And his glory isn't it one of his virtues. His beauty isn't it one of his virtues. His splendor isn't it one of his virtues. His riches isn't it one of his virtues. That is what we are meant to do. Simply show forth the glory of God. Amen. What he's saying to us, be an embodiment of my virtues. When the world is asking, what does God look like? Let them be able to say, wow, I know somebody that lives in my area. And that person carries just a presence, the glory of God. God wants to show forth who he is to the world. He wants to make it so known that the atheists don't even have any ground to stand. And he wants to do that through you. You are not small in the eyes of God. Stop living below who you are called to be. Stop living below who you are, you are called to be. So we understand that God can do all things without man, but he has chosen to do his work through man. God is all-powerful. He can do all things without man, but he has chosen to do his work through man. Each time God wanted to use to move mightily in a generation, he looked for a man. Each time God wanted to move mightily in a generation, he looked for a man. And so today, we'll be studying two wonderful people that God used to move in their generation. And when the Holy Spirit was revealing this to me, I felt I'd never imagined there would be any correlation between these two people. In fact, they're like just something I'll never imagine. And they are Moses and Jacob. Moses and Jacob. And the Holy Spirit was saying to me that, you know, Jacob, it was from him that the tribe of Israel was birthed out, right? It was Jacob. <laughs> praise the Lord. This excited me so much. I, praise the Lord. This excited me so much. So, let's just follow it. Jacob, right? God rose Jacob up when he went there to take the people out of famine to take them into where? Egypt. So he rose a man when he needed to take people from somewhere to somewhere. He rose Moses when he wanted to take the people from where? From Egypt to the promised land. Can we see a pattern of God here? He raises men when he wants to take a family or a lineage from somewhere to somewhere. He hears the cry of your family and they say, nobody passes the age of 40. Then God says, what would I do? Then he raises a man that will take that family from where they are into where they need to be. So that is who a crown is. A crown is somebody that rises up to take the people of God from where they are to where they need to be. If we're looking at the situation of the world today and we're saying it's not where God wants it to be, like the way he was looking at um, the people of, you know, he was looking at Israel and everything, I was saying this is not where I want you to be. So God said, I will raise a man. We see it consistent. We can understand a pattern of God here. He rose a man when he needed to move people from somewhere to where they needed to be. Are you asking why you are in that family? God is raising you to move your family from where it is to where it needs to be. That is who a crown is. Amen. Hallelujah. So we see here, that a crown stands in the gap for a nation or a generation or a family, like I said. And God is not haphazard in doing these things. God doesn't just wake up and say, I want my crowns to, to rise up and take this generation from where it is to where it needs to be. And then he just, oh yeah, you be going. He has the way he does his things. He has stages that he leads these crowns through. Amen. So we'll be looking at five stages that the Lord leads this crown through. I call them the crowning stages. And funny enough, they spell the word crown. So they are going to be five. C-R-O-W-N. Crowning stages. The first one, C, stands for chosen or called. Chosen or called. 
you are chosen by God. That's Peter chapter 2 verse 9, which is still up here. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I was asking God, I was saying, why did you use a chosen generation? Why did you use a chosen person? And he said, because what I want to birth inside of you is for a generation time. It's not just for you. What God is preparing you for, if you can see that it is not just for you, you would understand the big picture of God. If you can understand that the first thing that you are doing today, the time you are spending in God's presence is to produce a lineage of godly people that will take this world where it is to where it needs to be, you won't be slacking. If you understand that what God is doing in you is for a generation, not just for you, not just for your children after you, but it's for a generation. Like what Jacob produced, we will see the encounter Jacob had. It produced a lifelong generational thing, and it produced the people that we call the people of God. It produced a generation, Israel. That was exciting. That what God wants to do through me is not just for me. It's not just for my family. When I can see that it is for my generations to come, then I can know that I am sleeping like, like our sister Dolapo said. I need to stand up. I need to stand in the gap. Amen. There's this illustration of this game that people normally play. I've seen it played a number of times. Um, and they would put a blindfold on somebody and they would tell people to direct the person, right? And there would be one person that, um, that knows the right way. So everybody would be shouting, go left, go right, go back, and just to make fun. But that one person will be saying the right thing. Go forward, go this, go that. And the point of that game is that the person that is blindfold needs to be able to learn the voice of the person who is saying the right thing. So when they move and they fall, then they know that they shouldn't listen to that voice. But when they move and it's fine, then they remember, oh, that voice told me move here. So this is the right way, right? So it means God is constantly calling and directing people. So we see that, we see that from that story, you automatically know that the fruit is, sorry, we see that from that story, God is constantly calling and constantly teaching us in different ways. Another illustration that we see is, you know, we have that one person in our house that knows how to pick the best fruits when they go to Walmart or something. And we know, automatically know that when we see the fruit in the house and we ask who bought it and they say it's maybe mommy and you just know the fruits are good, right? Because it's that person that bought it. Something happened over this weekend, and I was asked to do a task, and I was just feeling very inadequate for the task for some reason. And the Holy Spirit asked me, said, you believe that I can choose, that I'm the best chooser? I said, yes. He said, you believe that I can pick the best school for you? you believe that I can pick the best major for you? You believe that I can pick the best spouse for you? But when I pick you, you believe I'm wrong. That is a way a lot of us say we believe that God is almighty. He is picking things for us. Father, all things are working together for my good. You gave me this husband, it is your will. You gave me this job, it is your will. But when God says, I want you for the job, ah, God has made a mistake. Check well. Check very well. That is how we stand in the inadequacy of God. But God has called us to something great. And he has called us to move greatly in a generation for him. But I think, God, you have the wrong person. Are you not seeing those youths on fire and church? Better pick one of them or it's not me you can pick. But God is saying, it's you I want. But you are saying, God, you've missed it here. Pick the other thing for me. But when you pick me, you fail. That is where a lot of us are standing. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. We see here that your calling is not respective to, because I know I am called, that's when I'm called. God called you before you were formed. Before you even knew who you were, he called you. He ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Don't live below that. It doesn't matter what life has brought. It doesn't matter the way the things are looking right now. This is what the word of God says concerning you. And you better start accepting it. Because a lot of us live in places where we say, we take half of the Bible and we say, this is for me. But other parts, we say, it's not for me. 
I had a story in my head in one said. He said a little a, a, a man will always tell his daughter. And God didn't mean it that way when they read the Bible. God didn't mean it that way. Like they'll read this verse and they say, yeah, God didn't mean it that way. And then the girl asked the father, well, if Jesus didn't mean everything he said in the Bible, why did he just say what he meant? Instead of giving us a whole Bible of things he didn't mean. So we better take the word as God means it. And he's saying that before I formed you, before you came out of your mother's womb, I sanctified thee. There's something special here. We are living below, we are living under the lie that we cannot live above sin. We do things and we say, we are human, God understands. But he's saying, when I created you, I sanctified thee. You have been sanctified from the womb. You don't have to come out and live to the lie that we are all human. After all, Adam sinned. Let's just follow in the line. He's saying, I sanctified you. This word is in the Old Testament, but it doesn't change. How do we know it doesn't change? Because Jesus brought his son. He said, I want this verse to be real in your life. So I sent my son. So you don't have to say, because Adam sinned, we will continue in sin. Amen. We see that Jacob and Moses were chosen by God. Even before they came into that school fulfillment, you could see them acting in that way. Something interesting for me was when Pastor Demola was speaking on Friday, and he was saying that, you know, before he even, you know, anything pastor, anything, before he even came into anything like that, he just knew that he was different. When his other friends tried to do things, they will succeed. But when he does it, ah, there will be problem, you know. And you can see that even before a person reaches that place, that they realize that God wants to use me. It's, it's constantly inside of you. You just know that I'm born to be great. I'm born to be something. It's just there. See Moses. God had never ever spoken to him about using him. But what did he say in Acts 2? He said, I thought, I thought that my brethren knew that I was the one to save them. Who told him? Who told him? It means you are covering up that part of you that is telling you that you are born to be the crown of God's glory. It is innate. It is inside of you. You already know it. When you're born to, you know, hold millions for God and move mighty in you just know it that I'm just born to be different. See, Jacob, he just knew I was born to be different. He was trying to do it his own way. He knew I was born to be blessed, but he tried to get that blessing his way. And what the Holy Spirit was saying to, to me here is that, or to us as a church here, is that knowing is not just enough. Feeling is just is not just enough. If you know that you are called and you feel that you are called, but you still have the wrong mindset, you become a curse to your generation, not a blessing. Can you see how Moses killed one of his own brothers just because he knew that he was called, but he didn't have the right mindset to be where God wants him to be? Can you see how Jacob was tagged the liar and the cheat because he knew that he was born to be great, but he wasn't going about it with the wrong, right mindset? A lot of us know we are born to be great. We are born to have, you know, do all these wonderful things for God. But then we try to do it our own way. And so God is saying, I don't want you to have the wrong mindset anymore. So what he does in the next step, R, he renews your mind. R, renewal of the mind. Renewal of the mind. Romans 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. God renews your mind. To renew something is to make it as new. And we see Jacob and Moses, right? There's one major thing that is very key in their renewal stage. God sent them to serve. It means that the place of service is the place of renewal. God renews your mind through service. He'll send you to a place to serve. He'll send you to a place that nobody even really knows. Or he'll send you to someone that doesn't even look like they deserve your service. And he says, serve that person. Jacob and Moses, it's so funny how these things were the same with them. Jacob was sent, because of time, we may not be able to read all these verses, but Jacob was sent to serve, and then Moses was also sent to serve. And I was saying, God, why is service so important to you? And he said, service is so important to me because he doesn't only use it to reform your thinking. He uses it to test what is in your heart. He uses it to test what is in your heart. Because God doesn't want to take you to an elevated place and your heart is not right with him. Your heart is not ready for where he's taking you to. So he says, I will put you in a place of service. I will use service to reform your mind. And as I'm reforming your mind, I will keep testing what is in your heart. 
And however you take that place of service determines where God will place you at the end of the day. However you take that small beginning, it determines where God will take you at the end of the day. Amen. Let the greatest serve. Matthew 20, 26. Matthew 20, 26. Let the greatest serve. What God was just saying is, you know you are called to be great. You want to be the greatest. You can feel it that you are born to move for God in this generation. You know that you are meant to be a crown of glory. You know it, then serve. Let the greatest be the servant. Amen. God wants to get rid of all those petty mentalities. Like, why can't, why can't others do it? Only me doing it every time. If you see how he used Jacob, he made Jacob go through the first seven years. Jacob had other daughters and, you know, Rachel was still a shepherd that time. We can see that God placing Jacob there was to get rid of that mentality of why can't others do it? God doesn't want you to reach the place for him and then you are saying, I'm not doing it because others aren't doing it. He wants to get rid of, I have dreams to achieve and I know how to do it. When Moses killed the man, he said, I want, to, I want to get rid of this attitude. It's not for where I'm taking you to. Amen. With a renewed mind, you are able to see clearly what God has in store for you. With a renewed mind, you are able to see clearly what God has in store for you. And a characteristic of a new man is knowledge. The knowledge of God refines a man. The knowledge of God refines a man. Then after God has called you, you know you are called, and he renews your mind. He makes you in the perfect mindset that he wants you to be. The next thing he does, or the next stage he takes you through, is oh, obeying instructions. God begins to give you very random instructions. Wake up at 3 a.m. and begin to pray. And they're like, okay. Or give that person $50. What he's doing, he's training your ability to hear his voice. Like that game that I was saying at the beginning. Sorry, I gave the wrong illustration at that time, but it was for now. That game of the blindfold, that person cannot get to where he's going until he learns the voice of the person who is saying the right direction. And that is what God is doing in this stage. He teaches you how to hear his voice. Two very little things, like our sister was saying. Two very little things, like... I want you to wake up at 5 a.m. today, not 4 a.m. And you're like, God, why? It's not just random. He's training you because he doesn't want you to get to the high place. And because you're excited for God, your heart is now right. Anything you say, God, I'll do. And you hear wrongly. And you go and start preaching when you're meant to be a businessman. Or you're meant to be a businessman and you start preaching. Because he doesn't want you to make that mistake. So he starts training you in his voice. He starts making you to hear his voice. Let's read Genesis chapter 32 verse 9. We can see that this is a pattern of these two people's lives. Jacob and Moses. And Jacob said, O oh God my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac and the Lord which says to me, return unto thy country. It means what? By the time Jacob got to this place, he had left the art of hearing God's voice. He did not specifically tell us that the Lord said this to Jacob, but he said, the God that says. So it means Jacob was hearing God's voice. Moses, countless number of times, when God first called him, he was through a burning bush. And the first thing God did was to give him an instruction. Take off your sandals. You're standing on a holy ground. And after that, it was instruction from instruction. Put the staff down. Pick it up at the tail. Go to Pharaoh. Wait. See this. Put it in the sea. Do this. It was instruction by instruction. Amen. This shows us that God will have you at the level that you are until you learn how to obey his voice. Until you learn how to obey his voice. You learn how to know his voice and you learn how to obey his voice. A lot of us are just talking about greatness. Ah, God, is going, I'm going to be mighty. You know, something funny, I, I, I feel led like to share this, but before, before, let me say, coming to this church, I used to be very ambitious. In fact, I had a book where I used to write all the dreams I want to achieve. By the next five years, this is where I should be. By the next ten years, this is where I should be. And when you meet me, you can, you can just, I will start telling you those dreams. Those were things that I wanted to do. And what I saw God doing was to first of all break me. Because he said, there are levels of greatness that are only reserved for people that work with me. And the level of greatness that I was aspiring, it's not for people that don't work with him. 
So he said, give me those dreams. Give me those visions. Give me those things that you say, oh, those millionaire dreams and whatever. Give them to me first of all. And I would first of all work in you. Then I would give you back those dreams. Because God doesn't want to take you to a place. There are places, when we read the promises of God in the Bible, there are wonderful things that are reserved for only those who serve God. You can't be outside of the kingdom and be wishing for heights that are meant for only those in the kingdom. But God, God is the Father. He won't take the food that is meant for the children and give it to dogs. So if you remain a dog outside of the kingdom and you are only wishing and saying, this is what I want to achieve, this is the way I want to be in the next five years, I will be this, I will be that. God is just looking at you and just saying, that is reserved for somebody that I'm training, that I'm working on, that is fasting somewhere for 30 days. You know, that's just what God is saying to you. Amen. <laughs> and so after that, after we've obeyed his instructions, we've heard God call us. We've heard him renew our minds. We've served. He has renewed our minds. We've obeyed instructions. And then God sends his word of confirmation, W. Word of confirmation. And why God does this, it's not, it's not a mistake that W is almost towards at the middle. That's because in the middle there's always opposition. And so God doesn't want you to be, he doesn't want your heart to be let down. He doesn't want you to be discouraged. He doesn't want you to doubt. God, is this what you called me to? Do you know that a lot of times as Christians, we make the mistake of saying that because something is smooth, then it is God. Because a particular job is going easy, then it has to be God. But do you know sometimes it might just be his mercy. And he's waiting for you to redirect from that place you are going to. Because they agreed and they opened doors for you and gave you the work or the contract that you were looking for, doesn't mean that it's what God wants you to be. Rather, something is so exciting. He wants to test if you can hear his voice, that what you want so much, he says, I don't want it for you, and you can leave it. So that's a test, too. It's not just every door that opens, ah, God, you've done it again, no. Sometimes it's, I want to see if you reach the level of, I see a door, it looks wonderful. It looks glorious. It looks great. But if you are saying no, I'm not going. I'm not going if you are saying no. I'm not taking the offer if you are saying no. I'm not marrying this person if you are saying no. I'm not studying this major if you are saying no. It looks wonderful. The pay is great. But I'm, I'm going to say no if you say no too. That is God's test for us. And we see that, that it feels right doesn't make it right as we said. The best part about all of this is that God will always send his word of confirmation. So like we said, doors may open, but which one is of God? Let us read Genesis 32 verse 12. Genesis 32 verse 12. And thou sayest, I will surely do thee good. And thy seed. Let's read from verse 11 so we would understand what was happening. Jacob was going to meet his brother. He was scared. He was like, oh God, you're the one that said this, but it still feels it still feels, um, you know, scary. And God sent his word of confirmation. said, believe on me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, this was Jacob talking, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me, and the mother with the children. And verse 11, and thou sayest, this was God speaking, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. This was God reminding Jacob of his promises. No matter how hard it gets on the way, God has called you. He has made your mindset straight. You are obeying him. You are walking in this path. But it doesn't look right. Things aren't really falling in pleasant places. Things look as if you are not called to be this. Everyone thinks you are not adequate for the job. Then God reminds you that I was the one who said I will bless you. He reminds you that I was the one who chose you for this job. And when God chooses, he's the best chooser. So he chose you. So he means you are the best choice. Amen. The final one, and this excited me so much because after everything, God has called you, renewed your mind. You've obeyed instructions. He sent his word of comfort to you. And then the last stage, not enough. Not enough. I want us to ponder on the great things that Jacob had seen. Jacob was so blessed that when he was going to visit his brother, he was calling towns, cows, 300, the servants should take this one, this one. He was so blessed. 
But let's read Genesis 32 from verse 23 to 26. Genesis 32 from verse 23 to 26. And he took them and sent them over the brook, and sent over that he had. This was all his servants who were sending them because he was scared to meet his brother. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled with a man until the breaking of the day. 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his tie, and the hollow of Jacob's tie was out of joint, as he wrestled with him. Verse 26. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Something that stuck out to me so much was, Jacob was a man that had seen so much blessings of God. What made him to go again and say, I will not let you go until you bless me? If I was God, I will say, what kind of blessing are you looking for? Have you not seen that God had blessed Jacob so mightily? But I was wondering, I say, God, what made Jacob to go back and say, it's not enough. Until you bless me, I won't let you go. And then I understood that Jacob, first of all, understood that he was a crown of God's glory. And to be a crown of God's glory, you constantly have to stay in a place that is not enough. The revelation of God you revealed, you got yesterday. It's wonderful, God. I thank you for that. But it's not enough. I want more. I need more. For where you are calling me to, I need more. For where you are, what you want to use me for, I need to be more. Five minutes of reading my Bible in the morning is not just enough. I want more. That is a person that understands where God is taking them to. And then God was saying that the kind of blessing that Jacob was asking for here, he had seen physical blessings. Jacob was asking for a kind of blessing where he sees the glory of God and it changes his identity. I see that it pained Jacob when he had to go and beg his brother. And he's probably thinking in his heart, see what I'm doing just to beg somebody back. I've been labeled a cheat. I've been labeled a liar. God can bless me. Money is going everywhere. But my identity is not changed. Who I am is not changed. And so Jacob was going back to God and saying, I don't want you to just give me these blessings. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the cars. Thank you for the children. Thank you for everything. But I want something that changes who I am. I want something that changes my identity. Because I don't want to be labeled a cheat anymore. See how I'm having to beg my brother. I don't want to be labeled a liar anymore. I don't want to be labeled a failure anymore. I want something that changes my identity. And that is the glory of God. So the crown of God's glory, he was asking for a type of glory that changes who he is from the inside. Let's see Moses' account. Let's see the Moses of account, Moses' account when he faced the not enough stage. In Genesis chapter, sorry, Exodus 33, 16 to 18. Exodus 33, from verse 16 to 18. For wherein shall it be known? And the, thy people have found grace in thy sight. So this was Moses. He went to God. He said, God, I'm scared. Just like Jacob. I hope we're understanding the correlation between their stories here. Because God is trying to bring out a pattern of how he raises his crown for his glory. He said, Jacob was scared. You know, just like Moses was scared. Right? And Moses was scared just like Jacob was scared. And Moses came and said, God, I won't go until your presence goes with me. And then God answered him. He said, for wearing shall it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not in thou, that thou goest with us, so we shall be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. That is enough to let any man go. That is enough. If God told me, I would be like, ah, God, thank you. I can run out of his presence. That's enough. But see what Moses did in the next verse. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And after God told him all these things, I will use you, I will go with you. But Moses said, it's not enough. Show me your glory. One key thing in these two stories is God didn't say no to any of them. He gave them what they asked for. We feel like sometimes we are battling with God. God is almighty. So even, even me, in my mind, if God just said that to me, I'll say, God, you've confirmed your word. Let's be going Israelites. But what made Moses to wait and say, God, what you said is not enough. Show me your glory. What made Jacob to see all the things God was doing through him? And he made him to say, mm, it's not enough. Send all my family away. I want to spend time with God. I will go until you bless me. And that, after these encounters happened in these two men's life, it turned them around greatly. 
because God was working in them and changing their identity from within, not just giving them the blessings. It's good to be blessed. It's good to enjoy the good things of life. But God is much more particular about making you see who he has called you to be. I once heard a pastor say that when you wake up each morning, stand and look into the mirror and say, God, how do you see me? He said, if you can grasp the way God sees you, you would walk around your day like a true God that he has said you should be. If you can just catch the reason why God looked at you. You know, some of us that I love so much, he says that no one can come to the Father except the Father draws him to himself. So it means in the billions of people in the world, God looked at me and he said, Tomiwa, I will draw you to myself. He looked at you and he said, I will draw you to myself. You will resist, but it's okay. I will bring you to a place called Empowerment Center. You will be fed with the word. You will be, you will be coming for prayers even when you don't want to. You will be hearing the word. You will be called to lead prayers. Even when you're like, okay, God. You will do all these things. And it's because he's drawing you to himself. I want us to rise up on our feet this morning.